Thank you for inviting me. As Andy said, I did grow up in Fort Worth and went to UT. Uh, and uh, have the brother that's the famous football player here. Um, also glad to see Kent Portney, who's a former colleague of mine from Tufts. Uh, and really told me something very interesting about uh, Texas that had, hadn't occurred to me and made me particularly happy to come here, which is that if you look at the city government as opposed to what's going on in Austin, uh, Texas is a very different place. And uh, Kent's written so much on cities that I should have known that already, but uh, he's absolutely right. It's, uh, it's a fascinating place. The, uh, the contrast here. It also is big on the distances. It's been 50 years since I've really lived here and uh, getting here from uh, the motel I'm in was um, I asked the young man downstairs if I could walk. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed too. <laughs> well, uh, here's the story um, about um, human rights and democracy promotion. In 2008, uh, Princeton, which is, of course, the home of Woodrow Wilson and the home of the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, invite, and Marie Slaughter, who was then dean, in, or maybe it was 2007, invited Madeleine Albright to give a uh, talk there. Um, and as a preliminary to the talk, she asked a number of people to come talk about Woodrow Wilson. It turns out that Anne Marie and I had, uh, you know, she became director of policy planning at state subsequently in the first Obama administration, um, had absolutely opposite ideas uh, on what constituted um, the liberal internationalist tradition or Wilsonianism. Uh, and it was really a vituperative disagreement we had. So that John Eikenberry, who's a very well-known liberal internationalist at Princeton and was a kind of a vice director to her at the Wilson Center suggested we do a book. Uh, the book did pretty well, but I thought it was a pretty bad book, frankly. Um, and the reason was that we didn't agree on anything and there was no agreement um, possible, it seemed to me. Um, now, you might ask why the issue is an important issue at all, and the answer is, that Eikenberry asked us to answer the question, was George W. Bush the heir of Woodrow Wilson? Whoa. Well, Anne-Marie said absolutely not. And I said, well, wasn't it also clear? Of course, he might very well be the heir of Woodrow Wilson. After all, the invasion of Iraq, because that's what it was about, was done under the flag of democracy promotion, not simply for Iraq, but for uh, what, was, what the Bush administration called the broader Middle East, transforming the broader Middle East. Uh, that certainly could sound Wilsonian. Um, well, after the book, the book came out in 2009, and then in 2012, Princeton redid this book of mine. Uh, the, the difficult thing about it was that Anne Marie held the high ground, not because she was right, I don't think she was, but because, or she was right enough, but because she had more influence than I did. She's a much, much bigger name, so what are you gonna do? Um, well, what you're going to do is to get your revenge in time. <laughs> and um, I was invited last year by the Woodrow Wilson Center, International Center for Scholars, which is in Washington on the Mall, a wonderful place if you uh, have a chance to go there. I was invited to come for four months last year to write on Woodrow Wilson and his ideas of what Wilsonianism means. <coughs> Wilsonianism is a term that everybody uses and it turns out there's no working consensus on what it means. Uh, reasonable people can have re reasonable disagreements. What it adds up to though is a weakness in the field because it has no sense of its boundaries, of its orientation points, of what it's really talking about. Wilsonian means about whatever, whoever is writing about it says it means is the problem. Well, this is not a good situation to be in. Uh, constructivism, and a variant of that, feminism, uh, Marxism, realism, 
These have their canon works, their basic definitions. Now, a consensus doesn't mean you have an agreement. It just means you, there are parameters around what you're doing. And uh, this liberal internationalism or Wilsonianism, which is the same term, um, didn't have. And that's why um, the discussion between Anne-Marie, Tom Nock, and I, and also Eikenberry, um, was unsatisfactory. Uh, I started, so when I was, I spent a couple of years just reading Woodrow Wilson. And then I went to the Wilson Center to write the book, which is now, uh, I hope, more or less completed. At any rate, it was completed enough to be at Princeton right now, and they'll be sending it out uh, at the end of this semester. Okay, so um, the question is, when I got to the Wilson Center, I thought, you know, I've been reading Wilson for a long time. What is it that uh, uh, other people have been saying Wilsonianism is? I better, I better do a more thorough view of the secondary literature than I had. So I picked up the first two books, or two books I needed to look at anyway, uh, Margaret Macmillan's Paris 1919, uh, which got a lot of good attention, and Ezra Manella's The Wilsonian Moment. I started looking at them, and they were, they were making serious mistakes in interpret interpreting Wilson. And I thought, this is strange. The books had some merit, but there were serious mistakes. And I thought, what is going on? How could they? And they were making the same mistakes. So I, uh, I thank you for those. So I, um, I began to look at their footnotes. And I noticed there was something very peculiar about their footnotes, which is that they had not cited, and I'm quite sure had not read, anything by Woodrow Wilson prior to 1912, the year he won uh, the presidency. Now, Woodrow Wilson had been a political scientist virtually since he was born, but, but, but for sure since 1879, when he wrote his first great essay on the French Revolution, or 1885 when he wrote on modern democratic government, or 1889 when he published a book called The State. In fact, Woodrow Wilson was widely considered one of the most prominent social scientists in the United States, if not by the time he became um, president of Princeton, the most prominent political scientist for which he became elected president of the American Political Science Association uh, in 1910. Okay, I started looking at other books. What had happened? I, I, the historians were citing each other. They weren't citing Woodrow Wilson, at least not prior to 1912. Well, almost a year ago to today, I was invited by Diplomatic History, the, the journal Diplomatic History, to give a keynote address at Williams to a group of historians on the legacies of World War I. And I, we have any historians here? Historians, we, a couple of people are moving a little bit, all right. Well, <laughs> historians think, with some reason, that political scientists plunder their, their work for case studies that they then make generalizations out of, but they don't know the facts. And so one thing they enjoy doing is having political scientists give keynote talks because then they can kind of eat them up after dinner uh, <laughs> for dessert. So I decided to turn the tables. And I said, you know, I pointed this out about Wilson. I said, think about Woodrow Wilson. Um, Andy, do you have that? Yep. I, have a, I have a set of... I don't do PowerPoint, but what I like to do is to, um, okay, but I need one for myself. <laughs> um, uh, th th this is uh, some citations I want to refer to. This is, I think it's better than PowerPoint because it's not just in a line, it's a whole citation. You can take it home, you can look at it. You also have my email address on here. Okay, so the, the question was, why the historians hadn't done this. And I asked them why they hadn't done it. And they said, but it doesn't matter, because Wilson had said that he knew nothing about world affairs. He did say that once. 
So did George W. Bush as far as that goes. The difference is that George W. Bush really didn't know anything about world affairs and um, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson did. Um, and uh, secondly, they didn't understand political science. Now in political science, as those of you who are, have been in political science know, we have a field of comparative studies. Comparative studies mean you look at specific countries in specific terms to understand them in terms of their own dynamics. You, I guess you have to be a political scientist to know this. At any rate, historians don't. So they assumed that although they knew that Woodrow Wilson had spent his life studying the origin, meaning, character, and future of democracy, while they knew that, it didn't occur to them that this had any relevance to world affairs. Well, woo, were they wrong. Whoa. So I began to, to realize that in their disregard, and you know, historians, if you know many of them, are usually very meticulous people. They simply hadn't read Wilson. Um, the great text of Wilson, the last of which came out in 1908, called Constitutional Government in the United States. Well, if you look at the, um, well, let's look at the, the second quote that I handed out here. It's a line from Wilson uh, in 1893 um, about Abraham Lincoln, one of his favorite presidents. And what he says is at the bottom of what reads page six here, Mr. Lincoln can only be known by a close and prolonged scrutiny of his life before he became president. The years of his presidency were not years to form, but rather to test character. The strain was too great to harden and perfect any sinew, but the, the, that which was already tough and firmly knit. Well, why don't we think the same about Woodrow Wilson himself? Or let's look at Henry Kissinger, a century later, from this from White House years. It's an illusion to believe that leaders gain in profundity while they gain experience. The convictions that leaders have formed before reaching high office are the intellectual capital they will consume as long as they continue in office. There is little time for leaders to reflect. They are locked in an endless battle in which the urgent constantly gains on the important. The public life of every political figure is a continual struggle to rescue an element of choice from the pressure, pressure of circumstance. Well, applied to Wilson himself, this means that to understand his policies as president, you must understand Wilson, the academic. And although there are books like, say, John Milton Cooper's biography of Wilson, which certainly have read and mentioned the early texts, they don't try to apply it to Wilson's presidential policies. This even includes the greatest in my opinion, of the Wilson historians, uh, Arthur Link, um, just a terrific guy who did the 69 volume set of the presidential papers um, of Woodrow Wilson. Well, um, now you might ask yourself, so what does this mean? Well, it takes us back to the year 2007 with uh, Eikenberry and Slaughter and Nock and me sitting around and arguing about what Wilsonianism mean and not coming up with a good answer. In fact, we came up with no answer. So if I had an answer, she had an answer. She said it was multilateralism. I said it was democracy promotion. If a Marxist had been around, the Marxist would say, no, it's not. It's the open door economics that it, it is what Wilsonianism is about. Or if a realist had been there, he, would have, he or she would have said, what do you mean? It's about America, an American striving, the United States striving for power and using things like democracy and multilateralism as tools to the end of preserving and expanding American strength. Well, obviously, with such a, a cacophony, you're not going to have people um, able to do much um, work with one another. So um, I went back and established to my, um, uh, let's see if I can write on the board with this, to my <coughs> satisfaction that indeed you can define Wilsonianism and you must. 
And it is, the result is what I call the virtuous diamond. It has democracy promotion, American leadership, um, multilateralism, particularly with respect to collective security, uh, and economic openness. Let's call it the open door. The result of the synergy of these forces is going to be peace. And it's the peace, it's the promise of peace, if you can pull all this together, that makes Wilson a liberal, makes him the first real liberal. Now, elements of this virtuous diamond had been president, present in American thinking before Woodrow Wilson, but nobody had put them together. And even Wilson didn't pull them together until um, uh, 1917. That is to say, the year the United States entered uh, World War I. As he thought about the League of Nations and what the League of Nations would stand for, he pulled it all together, but he never said it. <clears throat> well, why didn't he say it? First of all, he was a very sick man. He died of a stroke. Uh, or died of a series of strokes, actually. He had his first stroke as a young man. But he was in bad shape by the time 1919 came around. Secondly, Wilson never was much of an advocate of political theory. If Wilson, you know, were to materialize somewhere in this room today, he'd get a good laugh out of this little graph that I just, that I'm trying to force a coherence on him, he would say. But you can't Force coherence. Coherence isn't there. Life is too complicated, too multiformed to be reduced to something that this political scientist is calling a virtuous diamond? Please, give me a break. Okay, um, so my excuse is to Wilson. But this has to be done. And the reason it has to be done is that in the 1990s, Wilsonianism changed. The appeal of Wilsonianism changed. And unless you have some ground upon which you can stand to say what Wilsonianism is, um, there's not going to be a debate. An example of this. Why is it that the critics of the Iraq war were almost to a person realists or religious leaders or what you will, but they weren't Wilsonians? Why weren't they? The answer is that they were sucked in by the terms of their own theory to a, an invasion that should not have happened. Okay, now maybe some of you think it should have happened. If you think it should have happened, you think it doesn't have, that doesn't really matter to me so much as how the new thinking formed. Let's step back for just a minute. Let's go back to the League of Nations. In Wilson's mind, the problem was balance of power thinking. The balance of power thinking, as you know, is the preserve of realism. They, it, it, it explains everything. The relative position of states in the international system w through which they either seek to protect themselves or to expand their influence. We could go on and on about what realism is, but essentially, uh, I think that is a good enough summary. Now, for Wilson, the the idea that a group, a state, was going to think in terms of its own self-interest and not the greater interest was the cause of war. And what he wanted to do was to bring the spirit of democracy into world affairs. His notion of democracy was um, not one we hear that much about these days. It was the notion that people based on reason and faith, and it's important to remember that he was um, a Presbyterian who um, uh, was a, a daily reading the Bible and believed that, uh, that uh, reason, while fine and good, was not enough. You had to have faith as well. By the way, these Presbyterians are rather remarkable people. I'm not a Presbyterian, but they are rather remarkable people. They're highly democratic internally. And they, by the late 
18th century, they had embraced enlightenment reason. So that, for example, Wilson had no problems um, believing in evolution and thinking about Darwin. Okay? Okay, so the notion was that men and women of faith and reason could come up with a definition of the common interest that would then be ratified by the consent of the governed. It's, uh, we could talk about this later, but the, the notion is that liberty itself is not enough. Liberty has to be embedded in institutions. These institutions, at their beginning, are usually founded by great individuals. But once they are founded, they produce the rule of law, and this rule of law is what gives liberty, as well as obligations. You can't separate the two. There is no such thing as liberty without a rule of law that also implies uh, obligations on people. In the Presbyterian tradition, this is summed up in the covenant. The covenant is a way Presbyterians come together and agree that there are certain ways that, that they should act in the world, which they will do as a united group. But the interesting thing about Presbyterians, and one of the reasons I admire them so much, is that you can change your mind. You can say, because you can't really know God's will. You can try to know God's will, but anybody who thinks he or she does is a blasphemer. How can you possibly know God's will? Therefore, they were very tolerant. And they were aware that they might be in error, and somebody else might be right. So could we sit down and talk about this? Um, now, they move right along. I mean, as those of you who know the Presbyterians, they've just um, agreed to uh, same-sex marriage, ordination of homosexual uh, pastors, uh, women pastors for a long time, that kind of thing. Well, that, was, that certainly wasn't happening in Woodrow Wilson's time, okay? But the Constitution changes. They were not Presbyterians are not strict constructionists. You don't go back to the original covenant. You reinvent the covenant, but always with the aim of serving the common good and, the, and having you, the elite's interpretation of the common good be ratified by the consent of the governed. This was the basis of the League as well. The basis of the League was going to be democratic peoples controlling it, who would define the common good, rested on the consent of the governed. But there was a slight problem in 1918, 1919. It wasn't clear that either the countries or the people or the international elite was capable of doing this. They hadn't matured enough to do it. And therefore, American leadership of the League was called for. Because America was the best of the de democracies, since we did not have uh, much of an imperial past, at least compared to the other democracies, no established church, no royal family. I might add that Wilson conveniently forgot ab about African Americans, but we can talk about that uh, later. That's uh, an, uh, uh, an important and uh, interesting subject. Okay, against this was the balance of power. The balance of power does not think of the common good. It thinks of our good, we the Germans. And it operationalizes itself through militarism, economic protectionism, and um, imperialism. Now this is exactly the opposite of the diamond of collective security. The diamond of collective security says we're democratic, we're not authoritarian. We're not militarists, we're anti-militarists, although we will fight if provoked. We do not stand for perfect protectionist economics, we stand for open door uh, um, economics. Um, they were capitalists, yes. Uh, and we'll work through multilateral institutions which will themselves define the common good and uh, apply it and, and find it ratified by the consent of those peoples um, who belong to it. Okay, this then 
I was able to demonstrate in the book, both theoretically, I have a chapter just on the logic of theory, democracy has to be the key ingredient in this, theoretically, by any stretch of logic, logic, it trumps the other ones. It needs the other ones, but it's the most important of the variables. Then I go into Wilson's own work, and I demonstrate that his thinking progressed in stages. Stage one goes from about 1885 to 1900, in which he was only interested in democracy in America. He was only interested in perfect, strengthening and perfecting our democracy. By 1900, the Spanish-American War made him start thinking, well, if democracy could go elsewhere, could that improve things? So he got involved in the Mexican, as soon as he became president, in the Mexican um, Revolution. He occupied um, the Dominican Republic and uh, Haiti. He tried to set up a Pan-American pact. All of it based on pushing something like this diamond in the Western Hemisphere only. But at the same time, since war broke out in August of 1914, he was thinking as well of the role America might play in an eventual uh, peace settlement. And that's what we got. Okay, stage two. This is what I call classical Wilsonianism. It's Wilson's Wilsonianism. But as I say, he never said it as clearly as I've just said it for the variety of reasons I've indicated. Stage two comes with the uh, post-war period, the Cold War. And it starts off brilliantly with FDR. Um, now, how did FDR know to be a Wilsonian? Well, he had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Wilson. He'd gone to um, Paris for the peace treaty in 1919 with Wilson on the same boat. He uh, campaigned in 1920 uh, as the vice presidential candidate of the Democratic Party in favor of the League of Nations. And of course, just as Wilson was a progressive in terms of American economic institutions, so uh, FDR became the father um, of the New Deal. In short, he was a Wilsonian. And not only was he a Wilsonian, but many of the people who worked with him were with Wilsonians, especially uh, his Secretary of State, the longest serving Secretary of State in American history, Cordell Hull, who had worked with Wilson first uh, in uh, the teens as a uh, Democratic uh, congressman from Tennessee, and uh, then had gone on to be um, FDR's uh, longest serving Secretary of State, finally getting the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the Bretton Woods Agreement, which is the open door, and uh, the creation of the United Nations, which is a, collective, a form of collective security, a weak form, or multilateralism. Now, during the Cold War, I believe we won the Cold War not because of containment that we hear a lot about all the time, although containment was necessary, but because of liberalism. What did liberalism do? It created a open door economic system that by 1992, uh, or by 1991, that is to say, um, by the time the Cold War was fully over, um, had no precedence in uh, world history in terms of the prosperity and links um, that it had created. Through the Marshall Plan, it had laid the groundwork for what today we call the European Union. Through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it gave us collective security. It's also a balance of power, but it was also a collective security, largely from my point of view, in line with the League and uh, form of collective security. Most importantly, he democratized Germany and Japan. This was the greatest um, of the accomplishments of Wilsonianism uh, in the Cold War period and explains why we won the Cold War. Um, it's because Mikhail Gorbachev himself was converted, and I mean that in almost a religious terms, to um, liberal 
uh, internationalism or Wilsonianism. I have the first quote here that's handed out. In May of 1992, in Fulton, Missouri, on the anniversary of, Wilson's, of Winston Churchill's famous address in that very same place, Mikhail Gorbachev came to the United States. And he declared that the end of the Cold War, I'm citing here and you'll see the citation um, below, was a victory for common sense, reason, democracy. The United Nations should create structures which are authorized to impose sanctions to make use of other means of compulsion when rights of minority groups especially are being violated. The universality of human rights, the acceptability of international interference wherever human rights are violated. Today, democracy must prove that it can exist not only as the antithesis of totalitarianism. This means it must move from the national to the international arena. On today's agenda is not just a union of democratic states, but also a democratically organized world community. Whoa, Woodrow Wilson never said it this clearly and succinctly and strongly as the leader of a once totalitarian state. It's amazing. And it's, it, it emphasizes, it doesn't have all the elements of Wilsonianism, but it emphasizes the primary one, which is democracy uh, promotion. Well, during the Cold War, containment was important, to be sure, very important. Containment was a military doctrine and a diplomatic argument. Now, um, there are many people who say, including John Eikenberry, that containment was the dominant track and liberal internationalism was the secondary track. I, did, I don't agree with him on that because I think it was containment that made the mistakes in Guatemala, Iran, uh, Vietnam, um, toppling all those constitutional governments in Latin America. Uh, it wasn't uh, liberals who did that. They criticized it for the most part. But liberalism and containment did work with each other. And they worked with each other for one good reason. Neither one of them liked communism. Both of them were trying to protect the free world, although they were using different means to the same end. So there were sharp differences between liberals and realists, as I would call them, the containment doctrine people. But they also shared a common mission, which was stopping communism. And certainly Woodrow Wilson did not like communism, okay? Um, he saw it for what it was very early on, um, and he, um, I think would have said, unfortunately, in a situation where the choice is between a fascistic right and a communist left, let's go with the fascists. And, and this first starts with the Greek Civil War in 1946, but we see it being repeated again and again. Okay, so the liberals are capable of not being liberal, if I can put it that way, because the circumstances don't allow it. Now, to finish with the Cold War, you can see this reflected in the academic community's arguments, just as well as in policy making um, in Washington. Uh, the, policy, the, the academic thinking in up until the uh, 70s was very much of the notion that communism had more appeal than democracy in many parts of the world. And that where that was the case, we should hope for enlightened despots who would either improve their economies and so create a middle class, which was the bearer of, middle, of democracy, or allow for more pluralism in their societies, which would create democracy. It didn't work, okay? Not very successful. Um, but they were hoping that these kinds of things could happen. Well, let's see where we're going next in the final part of what I'd like to talk about um, today. Um, and that is the rise in the 1990s um, of neo-Wilsonianism. Now, by the 1990s, I mean the period that really, it's a long decade. It begins in the late 1980s and it goes to 2001. And it's during this time 
that we have three new ideas being proposed, almost all of them by political scientists. What they pick up on, and by the way, the, if the neoconservatives are the ones who are often cited, the heavy lifters intellectually were almost all Democrats to the left, and I would call them neoliberals. They were not neoconservatives. They had three, they had three essential arguments, which you probably are familiar with. First, democratic peace theory. Democracies don't fight one another. And therefore, if the, param if the perimeter of the democratic world is expanded, peace will follow. And remember that peace is what um, liberals want. And they could cite the European Union as an example, or US-Canadian relations, as an example of why a homogeneity of democracy and these other things could work so well together. But remember that all of it goes back to, to a moral vision, the moral vision of what it means to be a Democrat. It essentially requires this. And of course, the problem is that a lot of people who say they're Democrats don't share this particular moral vision. Okay, so democratic peace theory. Democracies don't fight one another. Secondly, but the problem with democratic peace theory, several problems, but one of them is that it says if the world were democratic, it'd be a better place, a much better place. But it can't tell you how to make the world democratic. The second school came along and said, democracy has universal appeal. It's a cakewalk or a slam dunk or whatever it else was they were seeing in Washington uh, in 2002, 2003. It's, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. It's interesting, by the way, that um, your dean, Brian Croker, was one of the people who um, was quite dubious about this kind of argument. He was right, okay? Um, uh, he was, uh, and I, I wish he were here today because I'd like to know why more people didn't listen to him. Um, how he got drowned out, but drowned out he got. Um, the um, third element uh, is responsibility to protect. Um, the no, a, juridic, a liberal juridical argument uh, familiarly called R2P. Okay, what would Wilson say about these three schools? The first one, democratic peace theory, Wilson, I think, clearly would have agreed with. This <clears throat> democratic peace theory is not neo-Wilsonianism so much as it's Wilsonianism that knows finally how to define itself more art in a more articulate manner to say that, as we hear uh, George W. Bush and Barack Obama saying repeatedly, <coughs> our democratic allies are our closest friends. If you've heard that, I mean, virtually any speech that President Obama gives <clears throat> on foreign policy, that line will appear. It's a democratic peace theory line. It was the same line that George W. Bush delivered, and I think that, I, I, I think you can say it's slightly different than what Woodrow Wilson was saying. We can get into that if you want, but it's, it gives a Wilsonian identity to neo-Wilsonianism. They, there are links. There is a, a line of <coughs> legitimacy that goes. So if we go back to John Eikenberry's question, was George W. Bush the heir of Woodrow Wilson? If you pick up on the democratic peace theory part, absolutely he was an heir uh, of Woodrow Wilson. It's the second part that's missing. In the second part, we have a belief that all the world is waiting for the sunrise of liberation by the American armed forces or whoever, and democracy will flower. This Woodrow Wilson never, ever would have said. It's inconceivable. And during the Cold War, the liberal internationalists never, ever thought this. This was pure invention. Now, who invented it? 
That's why I'd like to talk to your dean. He knows much better than I do. I'm not sure who, in, well, I know who invented it. Um, in academic circles, uh, the key person is named Larry Diamond. Um, and uh, he invented it very early on. You know Diamond's work? A little bit. Well, there's a lot of it. So um, I cannot imagine um, in academic circles anything more shocking than what Larry Diamond started saying as early as 1994, as early as 1994, when he calls democ the ex democracy promotion the global imperative. Well, there were others who then began to pick it up. And the essential argument, you can trace it in the comparative political development literature. The essential argument actually starts as early as 1970, in a way, with a guy named Danquit Rustow, who uh, is known for what's called transitology. That you can, that all these arguments in the 50s and 60s that went on through the 70s, that the transition from authoritarianism to democracy required preconditions and prerequisites and stages and international waves. All of this could be simplified into just certain easy political equations. If you have um, a historical moment of crisis in which there is a sense of national unity and political leaders, both of the elite and of the masses, who want democracy, it will happen. Rustow wrote this article in 1970, uh, published it in 70, and then suddenly it materialized. Suddenly it seemed that he had to be on to something. What happened in the mid-70s? Come on. Hmm? What happened? In That's exactly what happened. And, uh, and Salazar That's right. And the Greek military junta. Right. All of these went along exactly in the line of Rustow. Now, Rustow himself, to me, is no problem. Woodrow Wilson would have understood this too. Was Wilson thought political variables were the most important. And if you had a sense of national unity, which um, Wilson liked to call patriotism, in other words, a social contract, if in addition you had leaders from the elite and who were popularly based, who had a sense of what democracy is, and so you were into tolerance, restraints on government, um, uh, the obligations as well as the rights of liberty, then democracy transition was possible. So, Rustow suddenly was, you know, crowned king of the comparativists. Fine. It was, it was a, a brilliant article, although he did fail to mention Woodrow Wilson, but aside from that. Okay. By the time we get into the 80s, other people are beginning to pick this up. I'm not going to go through a who's who of political scientists, but most of the big names in comparative politics were now talking in interdisciplinary terms of the transition from dictatorship to democracy as being essentially a political issue. And one of the most important of these was Samuel Huntington, uh, perhaps the most important, because he was the best known um, uh, political comparativist or political developmentist in the United States. I think that's generally um, agreed upon. And I knew Sam quite well, so I knew what his thinking was. In 1968, he'd published a very important book called Political Order in Changing Societies, and he had come out for, in effect, military governments. In 1991, he published a book called The Third Wave, in which he said, this is how you do it politically. Here are the rules for politically organizing a transition to democracy. Whoa, in 23 years, we get from the most famous 
let's go with the authoritarians and help they'll, help they'll change, to the authoritarians now are all on our side. What had happened, of course, was the end of the Cold War. And what had happened was the excitement in so many countries, whether it was Nelson Mandela in South Africa or Kim Dae-young in South Korea, whether it was um, the Pope uh, working on Poland, or whether it was Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia, whether it was Oscar Arias in uh, Costa Rica and working throughout Central America, we had another rise of political actors, of effective political actors. Okay, this then made it seem as if, well, cakewalk and damn slum, slam dunk, we get back to that. That democracy were the wave of the future. Now, I said Woodrow Wilson would never have said this. And nobody in the, in, during the Cold War period would have said it. And they would have said it for a very special reason. At that point, by the way, I was a comparativist, much more than I was doing international relations. So there was a reason. What do you think the reason is? Why is the reason the earlier group would have been skeptical? It requires the character of the people to be democratized to have, excuse me, prerequisites, preconditions, uh, observed stages, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Wilson had said it himself. No middle class, oh, Barrington Moore said it. No middle class, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. But so had Wilson much earlier. The bearers of democracy are the middle class. You also have to have some tradition of limited government, some social ethic of civic duty and personal honor in the public forum. There are a whole list of things that could be brought up. Now, let's go back to Germany and Japan. Germany and Japan didn't democratize just because the American military went in there um, with MacArthur and Clay and company and say, you're going to become democratic or we're going to shoot you. The Germans, even more than the Japanese, had internally a, a strong middle class, a sense of national unity, a sense of threat from communism uh, uh, in, in Eastern Germany. Um, they had organized trade unions. They had Konrad Adenauer. They had Kurt Schumacher. Uh, they had Helmut Kohl. Um, in other words, the Germans, excuse me for saying it, weren't quite the Afghans, okay? And the Japanese weren't quite the Iraqis, okay? What we have in these countries that democratize is not just an outside presence, we have an inside ability. Now, in uh, 1993, I finished um, the first edition of the book that Andy cited, America's Mission, The Worldwide Struggle for Democracy. And in that book, I said, do not think, uh, and well, I guess the page numbers aren't not noted here, um, do not think that the Muslim world, Russia, China, or most of sub-Saharan Africa are going to democratize. They're not. Not anytime soon, anyway. They're not. Restraint. No, what we have won in the Cold War is a tremendous victory. But don't overplay your hand. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay, I'm coming to the end because we're getting into... Okay, five minutes. Um, so what we have then is, and we can, I refer to some of the quotes here, some of the amazing statements that start coming out of what I call the democratic transition theory. The people who think it's all going to be um, so easy. Let's start on page seven with Wilson and the neocons. First of all, Wilson. In politics, nothing radically novel may safely be attempted. No result of value can ever be reached in politics except through slow and gradual development, the careful adaptations and nice modifications of growth. Nothing may be done by leaps. More than that, each people, each nation lives, must live upon the lines of its own experience. 
Nations are no more capable of borrowing experience than individuals are. The histories of other people may furnish us with light, but they cannot furnish us with conditions of action. Every nation must constantly keep in touch with its past. It cannot run towards its ends around sharp corners. Compare this to um, Robert uh, Kagan and uh, William Crystal, repeated in two of their books. After we've already seen dictatorships toppled by democratic forces in such unlikely places as the Philippines, Indonesia, Chile, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Taiwan, and South Korea, how utopian is it to imagine a, chain of, a change of regime in a place like Iraq? For that matter, how utopian is it to work for the fall of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, of China, after a far more powerful and stable oligarchy fell in the Soviet Union? With democratic change sweeping the world at an unprecedented rate over the past decades, is it truly realistic to insist that we quit now? The mission begins in Baghdad, but it doesn't end there. Or, as they were saying at the time, real men go to Riyadh, Tehran, um, or Damascus. Well, um, now, uh, Andy's right. We should wrap this up. And let me say that on these lines here, I have a number of quotes from Presidents George W. Bush and, Presidents and President Barack Obama, which make exactly the opposite claim, that everyone can become a democracy. And there's even the implication that if you don't think that, you're a racist. That somehow you don't think other people are good enough to become demo Democrats. Is our democracy really such a terrific thing? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. I'm a liberal international ash, nationalist. I belong to Human Rights Watch. I belong to Amnesty International. I'm a liberal. But I don't think the whole world is waiting for salvation thanks to the US Marine Corps. And the worst people on this were James Dobbins, um, whose am amazingly prolific number of books on nation building were published by Rand, and which you can get for free online. And of course, General Petraeus's counterinsurgency manual done by the Marine Corps uh, and the Army. These, are, these books are so mindless as to have caused enormous suffering to millions of people, and all in the name of something I value, which is democracy, which is peace. So that we, and the reason they were able to get away with it without criticism for the people who should have known, that is to say liberal comparativists, is that everybody had signed on to the neo-Wilsonian viewpoint, which was an amazingly um, um, toxic uh, concoction. Um, it allowed a whole group of people from both the right and the left to agree that the, um, America's mission was to, to democratize the whole world. Lacking a sense of restraint and prudence, we got ourselves into the situation we find ourselves in today. I don't know how to get out of it, by the way, so don't ask me. It's just awful what's going on, just awful. But I do know um, that uh, we started it um, and that we're continue to, continuing to contribute to it. Let them alone. <laughs> That's what I've heard from so many people. Okay, so if DTT falls, democratic transition theory, then by definition, the responsibility to protect is nonsense as well. The responsibility to protect, and I'll end with this, Andy, was always premised on the idea that if we intervened in a country that was engaged in systematic and mass human rights abuses, we could restructure it as a democracy. But we cannot restructure everybody as a democracy. Germany and Japan are not um, uh, replicable uh, in other countries um, of the world. And yet I have um, many quotes here from um, Bush Jr. especially, in which he evokes Germany and Japan and says that people said it couldn't be done in Germany and Japan, and now they're saying it can't be done in Afghanistan 
uh, in Iraq, well, obviously, just as the first critics were wrong, the seconds are too. It's, it's really kind of sad. So that's where liberalism is today, and my purpose is not to bring fodder to the canons of the realists who would like to destroy liberal internationalism. Instead, it's to try and save it, to save it by returning it to its original inspiration, which is that however lofty the goals, they are extremely difficult to achieve. And to end on a cliche, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Thank you.